Matt was making me nervous there for a minute. I, I wasn't. Man, I told you I was talking to him. You made it sound like he was fucking ghosting us. I said no such thing. How dare you? You said Todd Gording's joining us any minute, and then. Yeah. And then I said, I'm working on it. And you said, is this another Ken Patera situation? And I said, no, I'm talking to Todd right now. Well, I would never want to throw Todd Gordon in the same conversation as Ken Patera. Let's be honest. Thank you. Or through a window that Ken Patera threw to me. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. All right. It's going to be that kind of interview. Welcome, Todd Gordon. Well, uh, good to see you guys. How y'all doing? We are doing great. The uh, the Godfather of Extreme is is that a is that a, a moniker that you've heard yet? Because I think I've heard that's Godfather a... of Extreme. Todd Father is amazing. I actually good. like that one. Sam made that one up. Yo, you're the Todd Father. <laughs> <laughs> come on, you you've got to do some impressions. You had some characters come through that locker room. Who's your who who's your go to? Well, Sam is the easiest one. I mean, my God, I'm with him so often, even now, that it's so easy to do him. It's hard not. It's hard to tell a story about him without doing him. <laughs> it's almost impossible. So how, think, often, how often do you keep in contact with guys like Sandman or people that are still, uh, you know, kind of active or maybe not even so active in the business? Actually, it's going to sound crazy, but it's 30 years or ever later, I don't go a week without talking to Sammy and Fonzie and Scorpio. Ever. Uh, He's That's pretty working. cool. Yeah, Sam is awesome. Like, he lives right near me, but Fonzie's in Florida and Scorpio's out. But where the hell he is now? But we're, uh, yeah, we keep in contact all the time with us. It's a really tight knit group that we've had for 30 years now. That's crazy. It's crazy when you think about it. Uh, did you, when you first, when you were first involved with the Tri State Wrestling Alliance and you wind up taking over and you make it into Eastern? What was the feeling in your gut? Like, did you did you ever have the feeling that this was going to be bigger or, or, you know, as big as what it became when you took over the business? Not in a thousand years. I mean, we were doing bar shows in front of 80 people once a month. It was like a little hobby. And from there, two years later, we're on paper. And don't even ask me how that ball just kept rolling down that hill, but it was insane. No thoughts about it being that big ever. All right. Now, now we're I, on the line with Todd. Oh, sorry, Tony. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Gordon. Uh, the Todd is God, uh, the st authorized story of how I created a stream championship wrestling. You can pre-order it right now on Amazon. It drops tomorrow. Uh, and I ordered mine, so I can't wait to hear it. And, um, you know, ECW, everybody knows the stories from ECW. Uh, what are some of the topics you cover? We kind of joked about it before. Uh, Tony was like, Todd Gordon's a mole. Uh, and I was like, you're not going to fucking say that on the show, are you? He's like, no, because I'm a fucking pussy. But you, I, would, I would imagine in the book, because that is something that is very associated with you, and there's a lot of rumor about that. You will address that story? That entire story is addressed from beginning to end. When you hear that story, it's one of the more shocking things actually in the book because it actually was something Paul and I were doing together and in order to help him reunite the locker room, which become fractured. And everybody thinks, oh, my God, it was him against. No, it wasn't me. And we were together through the whole thing. And that's in the book, and it's spelled out really clearly. The whole story is, there's nothing I held back on. Not the drugs, not the sex, not the rock and roll, nothing. Was there all out there. Was there anything when you were when you were you know putting this together? Was there anything that you thought like, okay, maybe that shouldn't go in, or were you completely gates open? Let's yeah. lay it all the fuck out there. You're exactly what it was. It was gates open all the way. Uh, it wouldn't be true like to the way I ran the wrestling federation. It's always like you know fans first, and you know if I like the show, then they'll like the show. If I'm going to shows myself, which is, you know by means of the audience became same kind of a love for the product. Same way with the book. I put every question anybody would have in there, and I told stories no one's ever heard before. Some of which are having on the ground laughing, and some of which are having saying, "Wow, I never looked at that guy like that before." Wow, it's 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 a lot in there. I'm telling you right now. So I, I got I got needled and chided before before the interview. So I need to ask you Who this. Chided you. Uh, the, the, the guy above me, and not so much the guys below me, but yeah, there you go. He's he's proud of himself. Which is the handsome one? That's the guy all the way at the bottom. Okay. See, we have to hide him down there to make the rest of us look a little better. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, who was it harder to work with, Gino Caruso or Metal Maniac? Gino's a piece of cake. Metal Maniac was, uh, you know, 
didn't get it. He was almost like almost Taz like other than that didn't get a push. I mean he just didn't quite get it. Metal Maniac story right at the top. Ready? Yes. Okay. We're in Chestnut Cabaret and Metal Maniac's gonna work Jimmy Snooker. Sit of course. Sitting in the dressing room. Dressing room. Of course, he finished his double was closed by then, so it was time to give him a ring. Uh, he's in the dressing room. Ivan calls sitting there next to Jimmy. And Jimmy goes, Ivan, <laughs> gimmick, good blade. And Ivan says, I only got this rusty one here. You know what he's at. Jimmy goes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you see Maniac going, so he hurt, he's hearing it. He's trying not to say anything. He's just watching. And Jimmy takes it, uh, first to put it under his lip, and then he's like, what, what, what? He goes, relax, brother. It's going to be okay, brother. Just relax. We got to the ring, and about five minutes into the match, Snooker <laughs> goes, like he's zipping him, but he's got nothing in his mouth. Up, so he's, he's dead, he's dead. <laughs> I mean, he's going, squeeze, brother, squeeze. And me that's going, he goes, Brother, what's the matter? He goes, I got color. Not yet. Don't do it. Zip him again. <laughs> now squeeze, brother. Squeeze. And me that's what. I'm thinking of veins that are popping in this guy's head to actually give him color. I mean, that's a great that one. That was just a good ribbon. Still got it. Hold on. Uh, Normally, the axe. First story I came to. That's he said his name was the first one I came up with. <laughs> Did you, did you ever ask the metal maniac to paint your face? No. <laughs> no. My house once. Not your face. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it didn't look like his face. Jesus Christ. <laughs> when uh, So do you go to Sean Oliver with this idea, or does he come to you, or is there a middleman that decides, hey, Todd, you have all this history with ECW. People are still in love with ECW 20 plus years after it ceased to exist because we don't recognize the WWE version, or at least I don't. Don't Good. pay any attention to the chuds below me. Um, whose idea was it for you to write this book? I did two DVDs, uh, played a uh, uh, KC commentary with Sean. And after that, we became friendly, so we just gave him the phone bullshit or whatever. And he'd say to me, uh, Oh my God, tell me the story about it. And I tell him the story. He goes, You've got to put that in the book. I said, There is no book. I'm not doing a book. You got to do a book. This went back and forth for literally two, four years before I finally agreed to do the book. And he said, You've got to put this out there. You got to tell the true story about what really happened there. People have this whole like mole idea in their head. They, they, there are certain things you've never spoken on in the 30 years you've been gone. And what really motivated me to do it, first of all, Sean's great to work with, number one. What motivated me to do it was, you know, I'm thinking about all these products that come out from WWE, rise and fall of ECW, uh, the history of ECW, and every one of them says the unauthorized version. Why is it unauthorized? I'll tell you why. No one ever contacted me once. <laughs> I'm the guy who started it. <laughs> I did the whole thing. How the hell can you do a history of the company and not talk to the guy who started it? They never once did. So I said, you know what? Maybe it is time. Let's put out the authorized version. Let's tell the truth. Bolts the nuts, go right for the jugular tip, you know, let everybody be, be aware of what really did go on down there. So so you, you just briefly touched on this. How do you feel about how WWE represented ECW once it finally, you know, was no longer, you know, in, in existence? How do you feel that they carried the legacy of ECW on? Good job, bad job, indifferent? Well, they didn't really carry the legacy on them. Some of their DVDs and stuff, again. They were only talking to half the people. They were talking to people who were under their employee. They never talked to Joey Styles. They never talked to Shane Douglas. They never talked to me. It was their main central people of this entire rise and fall kind of thing. None of us were ever spoken to. But all you were going to get is the New York guy's version, so to speak, the Paulie, Taz, Dreamer, you know, Bubba, their version. They weren't really going out and reaching out to find out anything beyond what they had to say. So, so would you, um, I guess, um, prefer like the alternative documentaries that are out there, um, and the alternative shows that were out there, like the ones that Shane Douglas ran, and and those? Would you like consider that more real to the ECW legacy than the ones that Sh WWE Sh ran? Shane's thing was horrendous, number one. Ah! <laughs> I mean, it was just god awful. That's not what he said. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh, the franchise was telling people to kiss his ass. <laughs> you, uh, no, these shows were terrible. I mean, Francine did a nice job on the hardcore homecoming. 
But again, it was a one-off show, so it's not really indicative of what the product would be. And it was pretty hard to ever replicate it, honestly. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was lightning in a bottle. It just, it just happened. It was this combustion between us fans, uh, symbiotic relationship we all have with each other, you know, where they were part of the show. And we, they, we loved that they were part of the show. And they were as equally as big as part of the show as Sandman, Sabu, or anybody else was going to come out. And they loved the product. They didn't come out to see Hulk Hogan or see one star. They came out because they liked the product. They had a chant for every wrestler that came out. Ergo the Todd is God, by the way. That's you know, from a fan chant. It's not a religious metaphor. <laughs> it's uh, the fans are yelling that when I go out to the ring, so that's what we went with the title of the book. And we even argued about that because I didn't want to use that as a title. Sean right, so, insisted. So one more for me before I take a powder real quick. Um, how, were you familiar with what Impact did in terms of their version of like an ECW themed revival in terms like EV2 it was called I believe did, I know they tried familiar? to do like a like an uh, invasion I guess it would be called we brought like four or five guys in yeah but you know again it just wasn't the same thing you, you didn't have the right crowd you didn't have the right music you didn't have the right any of the things that made the whole thing click I mean it was more than just one thing more than just performing in the ring it was from the entrances all the way through, it was really a well put together machine. Copy. Yeah, it's crazy. We talk about it all the time. There's a generation that's going to watch ECW on the Peacock app, and they are going to think that this is the original intro, and this is the terrible music that New Jack came out to the ring to. Oh my god! And it's like it's gutting. And they're going to think know the that public enemy who would skip to the Lou My Darling. I mean, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> That's an embarrassment. That was really so critical to our success, too. Because we didn't have the right to use that music. We had no right to use that music whatsoever. So, of course, it would have caused Vince a fortune, but we got away with using any music we just felt like using. Yeah, it was iconic. You you, uh, you uh, related to, you know, if I you heard Welcome to the Jungle, it was fucking Bam Bam Bigelow. You know, it, it was something from ECW always resonated in our heads. The Enter book, Sandman. which is Here available tomorrow. Step. Oh, I'm sorry, Todd. I just said, enter Sandman. Here comes the hot step. Or all that was. Uh... Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, the book available tomorrow. You pre order today. If you're watching this, you're listening to this, you can pre order the book on Amazon. Uh, Todd has got the authorized story of how cr I created Extreme Championship Wrestling, full of great stories. Is there anything that ended up on the cutting room floor where you're kind of looking back and be like, man, I wish I put that story in? I can't say that so much as we had to cut hundreds of pages. I mean, because all I did, here's how we did it. Sean and I would talk via Zoom maybe two hours a day for like three, four days a week, for like seven months. And all I did was sit there, drink, smoke, and tell stories. Like I was in the locker room talking to one of the boys. I go, what do you hear what Sam did this time? And then I'd tell him a story. And it, he, it's his job to take all these stories and put them in a chronological order to make them make sense, which was not an easy task to do at all. But uh, that's how we did it. I just sat around. And the book's the same way. You'll read it and say, I feel like I'm just sitting here listening to tell stories. That's really what the book is, is we tell them the stories. Uh, you know the story? Good story? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, is this the yeah. one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. All right. Sitting in the hotel room, Travel Lodge, which is our main place to stay like once a month for flea shows. Yep. Sam Ann, Fonzie, myself, and Scorpio. Everybody sitting around having a cocktail or whatever, and Sam goes, yeah. Is this room 705? We go, yeah, actually, it is. Why? He goes, oh my God. He goes, running to the corner of the room. I start pulling the carpet up. <laughs> I said, dude, I got to pay for this shit. What's the matter with you? You're not going to. Pulls out an eight ball of cocaine. <laughs> now, I understand, he's been in this hotel now five or six times. Since he was in room 705, he never remembered it. <laughs> I mean, six months I've been sitting on that carpet. And he goes, oh, squirt, squirt. Yeah, cop with bed. He goes walking down the hall, you know, just stop right in his pocket, his bare feet, and Scorpio is right behind him, and Fonzie and I right behind them. He's help me move this big gimmick, and he picks his big, like, vase up. It's out by the elevator, like his giant, like, statue. He lifts it up. Ah, I got another one. <laughs> at this point, the four of us, at least the three, we are rolling on the floor. We're laughing so fucking hard. It was just so salmon. Six months later, he got like a knock to the head. He was, oh my God, I got a half. 
half an ounce of coke here. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I, that's, I can, the, that's the kind of stories are in the book. I can only imagine what's going through his head. Like, what made him hide all this shit all over the seventh floor he, of the travel? He was living in Utah then. I had to take a flight home. Oh. I bring it with him. Makes sense. Gotcha. But, like, but he came back four weeks later, forgot. Eight weeks later, forgot. Twelve weeks later, forgot. <laughs> Attack. So, so um, I happened to uh, brush upon a headline. Uh, I guess you, you sat down with, like, I guess, Mike Johnson. Or Mike Johnson wrote a, a piece for you. Uh, on PW Insider, and the headline is not just about ECW, but it's also about life. Like, what would you say would be like the most important non wrestling thing you would have to offer in this book that you would want people to pay attention to? Uh, really, <laughs> towards the end of the book, there is one chapter on my sister who was my best friend in the world. And we lost her a couple months before COVID started, not from COVID, but uh. to brain cancer. Oh. And there's 12 months of being there, watching her slowly mature his PhD. It's brilliant. Like, is this woman slowly, you know, fall off into like first childhood baby and then incoherency and sitting through that and living through that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. Right. And it's not a day goes by that I still don't think about her and miss her. Had- so that'll be one of the most, it gives you a ch- chance to say, hey, appreciate what you have now because you, know, you don't know if we'll be here forever. Right, and I, I lost a brother, so I totally understand what you're going through, and I didn't mean to bring the mood down. So no, 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 that's okay. But you asked me that. Out. Yeah, that's what Mike brought it up. And I think made it. That's a beautiful review, by the way. Yeah, I really good. appreciated that. Yeah, yeah he yeah. wrote a beautiful story. So let's pick it back up real quick. Who would you say? Because this is something that we always like. Every wrestling fan talks about. There's Mount Rushmores of this, Mount Rushmores of that. I'm not asking you for a Mount Rushmore, but if you had to pick one professional wrestler that ever stepped through ECW's locker room. Who was the most influential wrestler that meant the most for ECW? <laughs> oh, wait! What happened? We got to bring Todd back. I'm we... here somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> how did that, Matt, Matt? What did you do? Did you get? That... I didn't do anything. Did you hear that question? <laughs> yeah, I said the answer is a piece of cake. Terry Funk, not there even you, close. There you go. And God bless him. He wrote the forward to the book, which is not something he would normally do. That meant a great deal would be. Does the forward go on forever? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a Jimmy Snuka interview once that went on forever. <laughs> that that, that doesn't that surprise it, me at all. Did it, it end at the bottom of a cliff? Jesus a little bit, yes. <laughs> he was a little bit whacked, you know, <laughs> as most of us were after the shows were over. <laughs> I'm fucked we, up, brother. We go, give, we go give us 60 seconds. And if you can't go 60, 45 is good too. And for the next five or six minutes, he started going, as the super fly <laughs> jumps from the cliffs <laughs> through the air, looking at the ocean and the cloud. And it's like five or six minutes later, and we're all leaving the room because we're all dying. And the cameraman's shaking the camera because he's trying not to laugh in front of Jimmy. Who <laughs> could break him in half like that. It, just, it didn't end. It, it was one of the greatest outtakes you've ever seen in your entire life. When, when you when you read the forward that uh, Terry wrote to the book, did you read it in Terry's voice? I do, of course. <laughs> you know, everybody does his voice. You have to. It, it, it's, uh, absolutely. It's, it's a rite of passage. One of Terry's great moments in the locker room as a leader was he brought some, somebody was talking about how they had injured themselves. They couldn't afford insurance and blah, 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 blah. blah. So get a rental car. What do you mean get a rental car? Come here, come here, come here, Sonny. <laughs> he gets a whole group around him. He's sitting in the middle of the room. He goes, yeah, get a rental car. Get the insurance. Drive it into a stop sign. They'll pay for everything. <laughs> Fucking genius. That's wrestling. Holy shit. Get the insurance. Always get the insurance in case you get hurt that night. <laughs> So crazy. That's the second time Jimmy Snook has come up tonight. We had, we, <laughs> we had a conversation about him before you joined us. So that, that's incredible. Kiss the characters there is pretty pretty unique to say the least. Yeah, I, I used to, I did like a like an indie show where I like I managed. Uh, I, Tony, would he be familiar with the Kodiak Bear? I'm sure he would. He was on my first TV tape. He worked against yeah. Sam in the very first pilot we did. 
Yeah. Yep. So I managed him against Jimmy Snooker, and we're going over the match in the back. And then, like, they're saying, like, you know, that he sits, he hits the splash, and Jimmy Snooker goes, whoa, 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 second rope only, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, so he did the, and I almost botched the spot. It was, it was, it was incredible. It was, it was he's a unique cat. You're right. And I'll tell you something else. He's light as a feather. First time I ever, like, really, basically, I guess, one of the first to ever take a bump, he was turning heel at a show. And he, you know, we got body standing, he give me the super fly leap off the top rope. And I'm like, oh, no, God, here, it was the end for me. It's my last day on earth. I didn't even feel it. Yeah. I mean, he came down crashing, and I'm going, eyes are closed. When's he going to jump? He'd already, you know, that's how light Jimmy was. He was so good in the ring. Oh, my God. Yeah. When I when I trained up at uh, Gino Caruso school many moons ago, um, it was after a show one time. Uh, we were all we were all hanging out, uh, just bullshitting, and uh, we had a we had a small skinny referee named Steve, and uh, Jimmy was there, and he's like, "Oh, we, we want Steve to get the Jimmy. We want we want Steve to get the Superfly Splash." So Jimmy puts him in the corner, slams him down. He gets up to the top. Steve was so scared, he passed out on the canvas before Jimmy ever leaped off the top. Wow. Had no idea he even gotten hit. He was so scared about taking it. Just passed well, out. The, the funny thing is, in the ring, he turns to me and he goes, All right, brother. Scoop, slam, fire, rip, fly. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> he just threw like six things in a row. I said, I got the scoop. And we came okay, up your scoop. And now he's already going. He's already off the top row. Uh, what? <laughs> that was insane to me. <laughs> I mean, it's easier to work with Scorpio on the ring. You don't understand a word he says, even in real life. We call him the bumblebee. It sounds like he's just bzz, buzzing all over the place. You don't get it. When he talks carny, <laughs> forget about it. When he's Love talking Scorpio. normally, you don't get a word he says. Love Scorpio. He is the best. God. So good. Uh, so good, too. To this day. Yeah. He's probably the most talented guy we ever had. No one really realized it. He can wrestle, he can brawl, he can fly, he can, he can do anything except promo. <laughs> <laughs> do we do we get any uh, ECW versus Dennis Carluzzo stories in the book? You get all of it. <laughs> Every bit of it. You'll find out about the time we caught him out in the back of the arena, unscrewing valves on people's tires. My security caught him and Gino Moore out there. I had to go out and decide whether we had him put in jail or not. I mean, oh, there's a lot of Dennis in there. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I just, I was just listening to an interview with, uh, um, oh gosh, who was that? Mario Savoldi, and uh, they said when somebody was running opposition to WWE, in, like the late seventies at one of the at the Armory in Jersey City, that they did the same thing. I guess letting air out of tires of fans was a thing. I don't know. I mean, he did everything he could. If he had put twenty five percent of the energy he put in trying to bring us down in his own company, maybe he could have made it successful. But he got so obsessed with our success that it was insane. He'd call every building before he went in there, call the fire commissioner. I think they're over, and we were always overloaded. Wow. They come in and start counting heads. He sent tapes to churches. We were running out the facility in Scranton or here, wherever it may be. Of what we the kind of stuff that they're going to see when we go on. I mean, he was brutal. We were in the car one time, me and Cactus Jack, and Cactus Jack said, I think she was canceled. Like, what was it? Dennis called them up. He told them, you know, here's the violence. He sent them a VHS tape. And the kids, was, he got out of the car, he saw pay phones in, jumped on the highway, got on the, and called him up on a pay phone, and cussed him out like I never heard Foley go off, ever. He said, don't you take food out of my fucking kid's mouth. He was screaming, yelling, going, who is that guy? It's so, you know, it's not the way we make kids normally. But, you know, he, he was pissed. Yeah, that's one thing I learned about with Foley. Don't, don't I mean, it, you know, it's every wrestler, but don't fuck with the man's money. Like, Foley's like one of, of the, course. probably the nicest guy in the business. But I re there was a story that he told about Stranglemania with the ICP when they when they put all the footage from Japan in their video and they, and they dubbed over it and they sold thousands of copies. And Mick was just like, you know, I think you owe me a couple of bucks. <laughs> yeah. And they paid him. Of course they paid him. But still, don't don't cross a man for his money. It's because there's a Mick Foley story. Uh, driving home from, I think it was in Boston, we were driving the cars. Me and Sam in the back. Uh, Foley was up there. I think Raven was driving. <clears throat> Sam, of course, you know, he's peeing in a bottle the whole way home because he's drank so much beer, my God, and he couldn't even. Will you stop doing that? No. 
Cut it's, out now. Todd, it's not us, I swear. No, it's that guy at the bottom, I'm telling you. <laughs> Not me, buddy. Not me. No, the guy, you're not at the bottom anymore. Ah. Yeah, we, we stuck Matt in the bottom where he belongs. <laughs> Technology, baby. So, All right, so so Sandman was it, filling bottles, yeah, yeah. It was in a van, and then the windows of the front had one of those, like, where you open up this little side piece, like the whole window didn't come down. It's just a little side little part that opened, like, this far, thus far. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you remember those? Oh, yeah. Sandman so, goes, yo, Mick, and he goes, the hands of his uh, jar. So he goes, no, I don't drink beer. I'm sorry. I'm like, oh my God, thank God you don't drink beer. If you take a slug out of that, you'd have fucking wanted to kill every one of us in the car. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, it's not beer. Piss, dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to ECW, guys. <laughs> Todd, I, want, I wanted to ask you, just another night, 1996, you and, you and Fonzie, Go, I mean, was it just around three minutes? I think Bam Bam, the bank Bam Bam was in your corner. Taz was in Fonzie's corner. So, I just like ha- having you and Fonzie put together that match. Walk me through it, man. <laughs> like, tell t- tell me something about just another night, nineteen ninety six. Yeah, three minutes is all you really need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Before we expose shit, let's go out there and slug this. And we did that every time we were in the ring, by the way. We did that at work. And we did not want to be like a Jim Cornette versus Paulie tuxedo match or Missy Hyde. We said, these people are, you know, we're preaching our hardcore lesson forever. When we go out there, let's just beat the shit out of each other and fuck it up. <laughs> and that's what we did every time we were in the ring together. Yeah. You asked Fonzie how many lumps he had and how many. Believe me, we, we, we beat the hell out of each other. So that night we said, let's go. Bum, 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 beat the shoes over a couple minutes, and Taz does his interference, Bam Bam does his, and then everybody's watching them anyway, if they're watching Taz and Bam Bam. But yeah, every time me and Fonzie had a match, especially uh, the first big arena match, we, we beat the hell out of each other. Yeah, because just another night was not a big arena match, that's that's for sure. <laughs> Len Olden, maybe? Uh, God. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I know where that came from. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, uh, obviously, very excited for the book. Uh, I'm excited to read the book. Uh, big, you know, big ECW fan. I, I, uh, I'm out in Minnesota. We really had to go out of our way to pay attention to ECW. Uh, so big fan. Looking forward to the book. But my question is, somebody who's not a wrestling fan, uh, what is going to pull them into the book? What is it going to make an enjoyable read for somebody that's maybe not, you know, not into into wrestling? Well, I guess the. the- you know, the thread through the story is basically a guy who was a wrestling fan. That's all I was, was a fan, just like you guys, anybody else. I was right there in the audience, you know, watching. I loved it. And then a matter of a year and a half, you know, we had the third most influential company in all, the whole country. So to see the guy who was even in the business to rise to that level where I'm dealing with Vince and Bischoff and people like that, I mean, that's in itself a story that you don't know rest, anything about wrestling to understand, like how someone like that can come in and become that big of part of the industry as huge as wrestling is so very much a very much a success story in a lot of ways as well yeah in some ways yeah <laughs> absolutely but yeah there's a lot of that and there's um it's how you start how i started and how we get started the promotions to begin with there's eastern and how we literally took step by step to grow that and the whole thing with eddie gilbert coming in and was like with eddie and then from eddie the transition to paul which was the end of their relationship uh, i hit on everything do you talk is, uh, about who is, in this book? I'm sorry, sorry Matt. Uh, let me just get this one out there. Are, are, is there any aspect of the business portion of of running ECW that you touch on? Like maybe even like the transition from you to Paul is is that heavily discussed? Oh, I'm telling you, there's really not a part. Nothing's really not touched on. Uh, <laughs> we do talk about the transition. We talk about um, what it was like to, you know, have to lay out money for the MSG network and Sunshine Network. And now we really weren't ready to spend that kind of money each week and how that really was the beginning of our demise in those years ahead of time. Because it was an exorbitant amount. And there was issues there, in fact, between Paul and I, because he said, don't worry about New York MSG. I'm New York. I'm Studio 54. Everybody knows me. Those spots are sold out already. And we never got one advertiser in New York. I know Paul's been accused of lying occasionally, but yeah, that'll come through the book as well. But as with all the good stuff, the fact that he was ahead of the time and came up with the word extreme a year before there was any extreme sports or extreme anything, how he came up with the music and he knew which music to play with which guy, 
and you know the grunge music. This you know, I'm still doing classic rock. You know what I'm saying this guy turned me on to so much new music. I mean, he, he's a genius. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he's a genius, but you can't have a personal relationship with him like that. But well, we did for a long time. Uh, and Todd Gordon's on the, on on the show with us. Todd has got the authorized story: How I created ECW Extreme Championship Wrestling. Drops tomorrow, July 25th. Order it on Amazon. You don't even need to get it delivered. You put it on your fucking Kindle. Boom. You don't have to wait for it. It's there, and you can wake up and uh, read it uh, with your morning coffee. And in August, the audio version comes out with Sean recording because my voice is uh, voice like a smoker for 50-something years. It's like, I don't want to do the audio. I don't like, understand a word I'm saying. So Sean did the audio, and uh, that comes out in August. Are there going to be... Uh, some pissed off people when this book comes out tomorrow. I'd say maybe two. Oh, baby. Oh. Metal Maniac. No. <laughs> He's a, he is in the book, actually. It's really about Snook and Zippity, I think, is in the book. Uh, <laughs> but no, it'll be one or two, two people, maybe. There's really weren't many people that need, you know, I need to shoot on, to be honest with you. Everybody else was like, I came in contact with, was, I had great relationships with. The public enemy and I were best friends. Uh, cause they both passed. The pimples. I mean, these guys are. I'm so boys with Gary the pimple today. Um, you know, there's Raven stories. There's story, there's stories about everybody in there. I'm telling you, there's some Fonzie stories that you won't believe. One time we're in Pittsburgh, <laughs> and there's Scorpio. There's Sam and I. And we go, where the hell's Fonzie? We can't find him anywhere. We just got here. So like, early morning flight. We've been up all night partying. Can't find him. Now the bags are coming down the chute. And as the carousel's going around, there's Fonzie sound asleep on the carousel. As the bags are coming down and hitting him on the head. <laughs> you can't make this shit up, right? Is there is there somebody that came through the ECW locker room that you think could have uh, should have accomplished more in the wrestling business? Maybe JT Smith. J.T. Oh. Smith was incredibly athletic and talented. And if he could have cut a promo, or at least been a little bit more forceful like Scorpio is, he could have been the same kind of a talent. So just just really remind me real quick, because I, I, I think I know who you're talking about. J.T. Smith is, is the Canadian who spent a lot of time in Japan, or no? No, J.T. Smith. No, J.T. Smith was the full-blooded Italian. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, who am I thinking of? Um... You're thinking of, um, oh, gosh. Uh, one of the Smiths, yeah. What was his name? He's in virtual Johnny pro Smith. wrestling too. David Boy Smith, no. uh, Johnny Smith. <laughs> Johnny oh, Smith. Johnny that Smith. was it. Yeah. Yes. Smith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, JT Smith and full FBI. Yes, I do remember him. Yes, hundred percent. Before that, you know, he did the "you fucked up" gimmick because he actually did fall one time and the audience being as kind as they were, let him know that he fucked up. He had a thing on his head like, out to here. Yes. Thirty seconds after he hit the cement, and so I sit on the back and said, "You know, I think you got a gimmick here." He said, what do you mean? I go, "If you can manage to do that." Because they were all involved in the, and the whole audience got into it as soon as you fell. If you can do something like that but not make it obvious, it makes it really as a fuck up. It's, they're already yell at every show. So he did that for about, I don't know, six months maybe. Then we said, well, that's getting old now. We're getting something else. So we came up with the idea of being South Philly, which is all Italian, heavy Italian neighborhood. Not they more than black people. Why not come out and sing Frank Sinatra? Really, really got to get some heat there. <laughs> And he came out and he did Sinatra, and at first he hated it, and then eventually just loved it. Because the more of a heel you are in this town, especially fully, the more over you are. Well, except for Bad Crew. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you really do go back. Oh, oh I yeah. do. <laughs> that, that, you, uh, bad Crew who got us into Allentown. Yeah. It was Bad Crew. Who else? Uh, the dad or something. Or step, step dad or who was the Who's the guy that used to look like a biker? You paired him up with Devin Storm. Damien something? Damien, Damien Kane? Kane? Yes. Damien Kane, Lady Alexander. That's yeah. it. God. What a oh, cast yeah. of characters. You, you go all the way back, don't you? We had, yeah. we had Paul Loria like a month ago on the show. Yeah. The giant Paul Loria. Yep. <laughs> he hit it off with my mother quite well. <laughs> that was a little weird. Do you have any, uh, are there any Hack Meyer stories in the book? Actually, no, other than the audience yelling Shah and shit. I mean, you know, and they, they just found a reason, a way to incorporate themselves into everything. Yep. That's what it was like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. At the yeah. beginning, they were bringing weapons in the show. 
That was awesome. We did the whole, you know, fans bring your own weapons. And that got out of control. We were bringing chainsaws. You know, stuff we had to confiscate the door, obviously. But for the most part, they would use their weapons. We saw one of the guys, whatever happened in WWE, took off his prosthetic leg and he had one of the wrestlers who used it. It's a true story. Prosthetic leg. What was the what was the most unique weapon you had to confiscate at the door? Probably the chainsaw. The chainsaw. I mean, you know, <laughs> who's carrying that into a show with them? <laughs> some somebody from Philadelphia for sure. Yes. I'm gonna go watch a show that cut down some trees and call tonight. You know, Terry <laughs> Terry Funk. <laughs> yeah, I, <tried>, yeah. ah. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> now you uh, so me and Tony go back. We been to several ECW arena shows and once ECW um, ceased to exist, I never really went back to the arena until about a couple years ago for an MLW show, which was another big mistake I made. That's a whole different story. Um, I can't believe it's the same fucking place. The 2300 arena is beautiful. Oh my god. They got a bar. <laughs> they got a rest, like a restaurant. It's like, you walk in there like, where am I? I mean, it used to be a tour that would happen. It's like, it's, it's, it's a whole different building now. Different atmosphere. It is, it is, it's it's un, it's unbelievable. There in the rafters hangs your name in the ECW uh, Hall of Fame. How much did that mean to you when that came to be? It meant a lot. You know, it, it, I can't tell you it didn't mean any time that people remember what you did. And it's been a while now. After 10, 20 years, people generally tend to forget who's who. So anytime I remember or acknowledge, I think the book will bring a lot of that out too. Yeah, of course it feels good. You know, and they put me in with Sabu, which is also great because I love Sabu. Uh, believe it or not, one of the funniest guys in the locker room is Sabu. People go, Sabu? Yeah, he's fucking hilarious. Oh, I believe it. I've read his Twitter posts. <laughs> <laughs> but he is, though. He actually is really very funny. To me, my, my what-the-fuck moment in ECW history was probably Shane Douglas throwing down Gary Wolf by the halo. What moment stands out to you as you're like, holy shit, what the fuck are we doing moment? Oh, that wasn't the, what are we doing? I mean, that's my idea. The whole halo thing. <laughs> Gar Gary, Gary had a halo one for, I guess, maybe 60, 90 days. Yeah. And he'd go to the hospital, Thomas Jefferson Hospital, directly across the street from my store. And he walked in one day and he goes, guess what? And he took it off. He goes, finally, he was sleeping in bed again. I can't I'm sleep in a chair anymore. Sitting in the chair for two months. I'm finally free of the halo. I just light bulb it. How would you feel about wearing it for like another couple of weeks? <laughs> you go, fucking kidding me? I said, no, I'm serious. I said, you just don't leave the house. But if you leave the house, you gotta have the halo on. You can put it on without, you know, going screwing right through your skin and you just wear it. Yeah. And that was all. I said, then we gotta get, we'll put something together that you and Shane will be like, fire. And he sold that so well. What he did was he put his hand in his pocket so that he couldn't, like, put his hand at the stop and stop falling. So it looked like he, and he had no balance. So when Shane grabbed him, he literally went down and he couldn't stop himself. We thought, you know what, let's make this even better. We'll plant two of our students there to come over to the railing, like, except before they ever over the railing, half the building came over the railing. Yep. So, uh oh, uh oh. oh. When an angle goes too well, I'm like, yikes. You know, like, Shane's going, get me the fuck out. Like, I was the first one in the ring to go in for Shane's going, get me out of here. How about you get out of here? I said, I don't know. We had to try to get you at the front door somehow. Like, holy shit. Yeah, I was, I was standing room only by the front door, and somebody actually, like, plowed, like, he plowed somebody into the glass that was in the front doors. The glass shattered. Yeah, he, he just I mean, got the hell out of Dodge. smart. They never did shit like that, but they really bought, bought that. They were going to kill Shane that night. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. They were going to go at the very beginning. Oh, my God. The fans were waiting outside bricks and bats. Yeah. We had to sneak Fonzie out of the arena that night. <laughs> was and that more chaotic? Jim Thorpe. You know Jim Thorpe? You ever been Jim Thorpe? Yeah. Well, to the top of the mountain. So I told you, Fonzie, Sam, and Thorpe and I would always travel together. And we'd always make Fonzie get out halfway up the hill and say, hey, brother, you can't walk in with us. And he'd look up the hill and goes, hey, daddy, come on, man. I'll hide the back. Now, Fonzie, you got to walk up the hill, man. We always make him walk up the hill. <laughs> uh, 
was the Gary Wolf Halo more chaotic than the uh, the time Terry Funk asked for a chair uh, both times? I would, well, yeah. <laughs> I said the two times I've ever really scared most of these back in suit was the chair throwing incident, which of course we you know buried by putting it on the opening of our TV show every week. Yep. So <laughs> every song like over and over and over again. And the other one, which also was our opening, was the Florida Public Enemies of the Ring. Yep. The match. Like, hey, guys, come on. There's like four kids. Come on, you few four kids. Come on in here. Next thing you know, there's three other people in the ring. And when you're the one who's going to get sued, you're going, and I couldn't talk on both times. Thank God. We managed to get through both those incidents unscathed. But, oh, my God, it was a scary incident for me. That is those those images are burned into my brain like the uh, the night kimono on Alaya dance to top these. <laughs> <laughs> and God bless her for that. Yeah, she saved our asses. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's 120 degrees in that building with all the people in there. The air conditioning work for shit, and the ring breaks. And we're going not to Al. It's not even one of his crew. I go, how long is it going to take? Well, uh, we could mail away for a piece. I mean, yeah, that's. We're going to a show. You realize that, right? <laughs> you well, then like try to rig it up somehow. I go, that sounds like a better plan than you know, us sending away for a piece. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it took like an hour, what, 45 minutes to an hour? And she volunteered to go up there and do that. And some of the girls in the back were like, oh, that's disgusting. And I turned around and I literally said, you know what? Fuck you. She's saving our asses tonight. And people will still come back next month because she did that. Don't well, discuss to you this about the girls out that night. Wait, wait, who was saying disgusting? If I remember, Tommy Dreamer was pile driving everybody with their asses showing and their panties showing, and now those were the people who were saying disgusting. Wow, that's crazy. Who do you think was used best after they left ECW? I know there's a lot of names to to consider there. I guess Bubba. I mean, he became the biggest star when everybody was there. Yeah. But if you think about career wise, who had the best career after that? Has to be Bubba, right? Maybe RV, RVD. Maybe Lance Storm I mean, in WCW, I, maybe. I mean, maybe Taz. Taz got into broadcasting, you know? Yeah, they all had. I'm saying that there were other people that were successful. Right, right, right. But he right. went from company to come into this day. He's headlining indie shows. He, he wants to step into a. And the way he show you stage, he's definitely any federation, they're welcoming with open arms. Yeah. He's, you, uh, he's a tough guy. Would you put Jericho on that list? You know, Jericho wasn't there that long. We, we were the first no, ones to bring him in. And I remember him working with a Pitbull 2 and um, it was a four way dance. And yeah, Scorpio. the four way. It was a great match. Who was the four way? Pitbull 2, Jericho, Scorpio. Oh, gosh. Douglas. That's, no, when, that's so. when Francine turns on the Pitbulls. Dur during the four-way with Jericho. Yeah. Jer Jericho was the TV champion. He loses it to Douglas. I think that's his out. Okay. Well, so, again, he was, you know, we, we knew we saw something. We said, this guy's got psh, he's got a lot. I mean, he's, he's a hell of a hand, you know what I'm saying? But he wasn't there long enough for me to say it. Home an ECW guy who made it big. Yeah. And right. We said, we said see, Austin was an ECW guy, but he wasn't. He, we're just a transition for him in between one company to the next. Would you it was Heat Wave 96. Would, yes. would, you, good. would you consider Foley an ECW guy? Yeah, because he was there yeah. for a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, he was the, you know, the hardcore guy, the hardcore legend. Yeah. Uh, we, we, watched, uh, we watched one of those, uh, I don't know, Hidden Treasures, whatever the show is that WWE goes around, and I guess Foley's one of the hosts now. And, uh, you know, for years he had long hair, so now without his long hair you see his mangled ear. And my kid asked me, he goes, what's wrong with his ear? I go, he lost it in Germany years ago, which was funny because then I started telling him the stories about the I'm Hardcore promos where he'd be like, oh, I have to read something. Let me put on my glasses. Oh, they won't stay on because I'm Hardcore. <laughs> How great was that turn? Amazing. We thought it was, any, we could not, between Paul and I, we're both very creative guys. We had no clue how to turn him. We knew he had run his course doing what he was doing. We approached him. He said, "Let me think about it." He came back with that. And says, "How about if I go anti-hardcore? I do everything but hardcore. I mat wrestle. I don't give fans the chair shots. I don't give any." And damn, that didn't work. He actually turned himself you know, in front of a crowd that idolized him. And that and that all stemmed from the Kane Dewey sign, didn't it? Well, he used that as his yeah. fulcrum. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, that guy, sign guy, he never came back after that. Right. He bought season tickets and he was there every show. And that affected him somehow and he didn't come back. It's crazy. It's Last, crazy. He was the guy with the Todd Scott sign. that made the whole building start doing it. He was... Last one, last one for me, Todd, real quick. Uh, you mentioned Paul briefly just uh, in the prior statement here. Well, what are your thoughts on what he's doing now in, uh, in WWE in terms of on camera and off camera? Well, obviously, the Bloodline storyline is brilliant. I mean, it took it made it into a year storyline. It's like almost like Dreamer Raven kind of thing. It just went on and on and on. Or, or Sandman Raven. The storyline just kept expanding. Now we're adding Tyler, Sandman's kid. Now we're adding, you know, it just kept expanding and expanding. Uh, what he's done there, I'm sure that's his writing. It's been absolutely brilliant. I think that he may be too old at this point to be the character he's playing. I mean, he still has a gift of gab like nobody, but I think he's a little bit out of place now with, it, with that grouping of 23 and 30 year old people. Uh, but his writing ability hasn't changed at all. And his ability to get someone over hasn't changed at all the promo. I just think he's a little bit too much in front of the camera. You think it's a rib that they make him carry around those two championship belts everywhere? <laughs> uh, no, they do better ribs than that there. Uh, I, think he, I think he likes that old. I'm sure everything he's doing out there, he, it's his decision. Yeah, but those suckers oh, yeah, got to be he, heavy to hold for like 15, 20 minute promos oh, yeah. and all. <laughs> but they, you know, they give him a lot of leeway there. He's got a lot of rope. Oh, for sure. Let me ask you, you mentioned the Mick Foley turn, and uh, he was, was in the spotlight recently because of the dark side of the ring. I think that Matt Bourne, Born Again thing, I think if that had run its course, I think it would have been amazing. And you were there for that. Um, is it sad to see someone like Matt Osborne in that condition? Like, that idea yeah. was fantastic. Like, he was fucking doing the clown, and he was, like, being reborn with Shane. Like, kill the clown, face. fucking 911. Yeah. yeah. It, it ah. was two-faced, yeah. Right out of the comic strips, and that was a great concept. Since then, I've seen Dustin do it. I've seen a couple other people do it, but yeah, that's the first time we had seen that. That was that was really bright. That was great. It was a great idea. It never got the run's course. Yeah, such a shame because I think there were so many, so much likes with that, especially the anti W. Oh ah. yeah, brilliant Absolutely. stuff here. Uh, and he we're was on the so phone. talented. We're on the line with Todd Gordon, the authorized story of how I created ECW, available for uh, pre-order tonight. And then tomorrow you just buy the book. You put it on your Kindle. If you like uh, to hold a book like I do, I already pre-ordered mine, so it might take a day or two to get here. But it's definitely, if you're a wrestling fan, uh, you've enjoyed this Todd Gordon interview, you like ECW, you just want a book that kind of, uh, as Kevin said, is kind of a success story, uh, you should definitely check out Todd as God, the authorized story of how I created Extreme Championship Wrestling. Todd, do you have a favorite story that you tell in this book? Well, you know, one of my favorite angles was like the Sandman blinding angle. I mean, that was possibly the best angle we ever did. Yep. I thought, I and mean, we had a bunch of 1,500 people there, literally a 1,000 were, were smart to the business. We thought nothing could be walking out and saying, is there an ophthalmologist just in the house? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, but that was so real. The wrestlers were calling me up for two weeks. You heard from Sandy Man? What you, what's going on with Sandy Man? The sheet writers, like, talk about Dave Shear, who I respect tremendously. Todd, Sandy Man, okay? I go, we don't know. Like, everybody bought that. Everybody. And we never smartened the boys up. But the night he came back, he ripped the bandages off. And he wouldn't answer his phone. I mean, he's great like that. He knows how to play, you know, play the angle out. So he never took a wrestler's call. Pete's always had to answer the phone. Says, he's not taking any calls. And the boys were like, holy shit, man. Same as he's blind. Like, well, that's fucked up. So when we did that, that was, that was really a great angle. And he's so smart to the business. Yeah, you remember fucking a box? Anybody yeah. fucking a box? Yes. Yeah. Was that, uh, that they did that with fucking stupid DC Drake, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole idea was that you know, Sammy couldn't wrestle and had concussions. So he comes out, all dressed, and he's going to bring out his guy, bring box, out comes D.C. Drake. Of course the crowd shits on it. That's what one of them does. <laughs> Sammy starts fighting with him, and he knocks him into the box, and he pulls him out with the blanket on top of him, pulls it off of the rings, Terry Funk. What made that angle work was Sammy was smart enough to go to the store and buy two pair of red, white, and blue sweatpants, the exact same sweats. None of us thought of that. They pulled Funk out of there in a different outfit. 
you know, right away when you start bands. But the same in me that I go work, I think you through my guy looking the exact same when he comes out, he's covered from the top. When you're going to see his bottom, and that's what made that angle go. What a great angle that was. That flag of cable for funk, that place went berserk. It was a great angle. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Todd, this has been an unbelievable talk. Uh, I am super excited for this book to drop tomorrow. I can't wait to get my hands on it. I hope you enjoyed your time here. Guys, I had a blast here. I hope after the book comes out, you read it. We can do it again and discuss it. 100%. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. Nice. Cool. Absolutely. You guys, Todd, I, you guys have a great show. Thanks so much. Oh, Todd, thank you, man. It was an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we can make this work. And I'm again, I can't put over how excited I am for this book tomorrow. Thank Before you so I much. let you go, I got to ask. I ask everybody this question every time. Oh, we're on here the show. we go. Oh, no, here it no, is. No. All right, Todd. Got to do it. When was the last time you shit your pants? Childhood? I, mean, I don't know. I couldn't That's tell you. Question. Certainly not in the ring. That's what you're trying to get at now. No, I, look, I, look. Everyone's got a story. Some of the wrestlers, maybe they make bad decisions in their uh, travel travel snacks. Yeah. Uh, no, we, no, not me. Sorry. No, you're that Todd. I'm going to let you know. See, you're an outlier. You're one of the few that didn't have a shit their pants story. Yeah. Well, I was only wrestled a few times in the ring, so who knows? Yeah, but it's not just in the ring. It's just in life. Everybody, you know. Shits their pants, or at least I like to tell people that. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> he literally just said it was a great interview and a great show, and then you hit him with the shit your pants question. <laughs> hey, he rises to the top. <laughs> you know what? When, when Todd comes back, the first story he's going to tell us is he's going to say, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> no sooner I was off the air with you guys. Than <laughs> <laughs> Icons of wrestling at a line. <laughs> 100 deep signing autographs. I had a fucking something for the diner that morning. And I, fuck, I shit my jaws. Guys, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Todd. Thank you. Great we'll pleasure. talk soon. We'd love, love to get you back on after we all get a chance to meet you. I enjoyed it that much. I'd love to come back. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks again, Todd. Best you of luck with the book. Thank you so Todd much. Todd is God. Todd Gordon. Uh, the authorized story of how I created Extreme Championship Wrestling. Pre-order it right now on Amazon or tomorrow when it comes out or wherever you get your books. Uh, and, oh, God. <laughs> You're looking good, T-Donk. I'm always looking good. Look at me. You look very svelte. Thank you. That was awesome. Todd's an awesome dude.